All right, we're going to go ahead and get uh, started. So uh, this afternoon, uh, we have a, a great presentation uh, to be given by uh, two uh, speakers. Uh, this uh, presentation is entitled, This Kind Does Not Come Out But by Prayers and Fasting. And our presenters are Fotini and Nico Berbilis. Uh, so uh, Fotini uh, has a bachelor's uh, from the American College of Athens and a master's in counseling uh, psychology from uh, uh, Ball State University in Indiana. Uh, Nico uh, has her Master's of Divinity uh, from Holy Cross uh, and is about to uh, take over as the OCMC Marketing Coordinator. Is that right? No, I have taken over. Oh, you have taken over. Very good. So we look very much forward to your presentations. Originally, we were going to be three that we were going to um, hold this workshop and um, Father Christodoulos uh, was asked to leave to go to Nebraska. However, the one special thing that I want to share with you that did when bef uh, before he left, um, I asked him, Father Christodoule, you're leaving us and we're not going to have your participation. And he said, but I will participate. And we were driving, and he said, we're going to have a little prayer service in the car. And this is exactly what we did. We had the prayer service, and it was important for me, and it was important for the type of workshop we're going to have, because it's all about a container that it is based on uh, theology, and when we put things inside that container, they give that kind of um, anchoring, that kind of substance. And um, that's why we decided that we will start by extending that container with all of us by, if we can stand up and have the prayer all together. Heavenly King, comforter, the spirit of truth, present in all places, and filling things, treasury of blessings, and given of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from all impurity, and save our souls, O oh good one. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to have three stories we are going to talk about. And the one story, is about uh, taken from the gospel where it is a time when Christ himself was present. The second story is several years back when one of his saints used to be a Paris priest. I'm talking about Saint Nectarius who actually uh, we celebrated yesterday. And the third story, which we are all going to work together, is based on a story that a typical clinician with orthodox uh, foundation uh, background um, carried. And this is me. So let's start with the first story. Um, you want to speak yeah. here? So as we, as we go through each of these stories, of course, the theme of the entire conference is situations of resistance and compliance. And we're kind of generalizing that not only into resistance and compliance on the side of the client, but also more generally um, situations where on, on, on the side of the clinician, it's, there's a straightforward approach to the situation or not so straightforward. Perhaps there's no clear solution to what we're working towards. Um, and we're going to kind of compare these different kinds of situations. How are they different? How are they related? Where do solutions come from? And again, what is the role of the clinician in each case as we go through these stories? So the first story, uh, we're, we're going to start with just the conflict in the story and draw some parallels from it. Uh, this is taken from Matthew 17, 14 to 16. And you have it in the outline as well in front of you. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and read it. 
And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, to Christ, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. So something different is happening here. First of all, let's break it down. The problem in this situation, the disciples are unable to cast this demon out of the boy. Now we're going to draw some metaphorical parallels. We're going to do this from each story so that we can see how we can apply it. In this case, we're connecting both the disciples and to Christ to the role of the clinician. Both are put in a position of offering some kind of advice and, uh, or being in the, in the position of attempting to provide a solution, attempting to help the problem. The possessed boy is akin to the client in the situation, and the failure to cast out the demon is some sort of resistance to treatment, whether because the client himself is being resistant to it or because other circumstances in the situation are preventing any straightforward solution. So this is the first story. Remember that, hold on to that, and consider those dynamics. They're unable to cure him. What's going to happen next? We're going to pause that for a minute and now come over to St. Nectarios and see what happens in that story. A grandmother is visited by her two grandchildren who are running away from home. The parents, uh, the, the two grandchildren, uh, the father is a very abusive alcoholic. And the mother is tolerating this behavior. The brother, being 16 year old, one of the two children, decided to take his sister, who was 14 year old, and from the village to take a bus and go to live with the grandmother. When they arrive to, gran to the grandmother, the grandmother uh, wants to let her daughter know, the mother of the children, that the kids are safe and with her. And the children tell her that if you call mom, we're going to leave and you will never see us again. Her spiritual father was Saint Nectarius, at that time, Father Nectarius. And they went to he, she went to, to Father Nectarius asking, what should I do? How can I um, help this? My daughter is um, hurting, dying from pain, and the children, I have to take care of the children. And Father Nectarius said, what I want from you to do is I want you to do 40 prayers to Theotokos, 40 paraclesis. And at the same time, I want you to fast, and I will be also praying along with you. Um, the grandmother uh, did exactly what uh, St. Nectarius did. Okay. So this is the conflict. So the grandmother is in a situation where there's a big problem. The children kind of have nowhere to go. Either they can stay with the grandmother, um, and, and their parents despair, especially their mother, or they can be sent home to an abusive situation. The grandmother is kind of stuck between these dynamics, wanting to help her daughter by comforting her. Your kids are okay, they're with me. Um, risking the kids running away, or you know, finding a way to bring the kids home, but that's a bad situation. So, the problem. Grandmother can neither tell the children to go home, nor tell their parents where the children are. The parallels we're drawing, again, the grandmother and St. Nectarios are akin to the clinician. They're both in this situation, in this position of trying to offer help, trying to find some resolution. Children, we're connecting to the role of the client. And, and the perceived powerlessness of the grandmother uh, is like resistance to treatment on behalf of the client. So there are some parallels between this story and the previous one. Now we're going to go through and see the solutions of both stories. Um, we're probably familiar with this one already. Uh, in, in continuing on in the book of Matthew, Matthew 17, 17 to 21, the disciples ask, why could we not cast it out after Christ successfully casts out the, demons, the demon where the disciples had failed? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, 
If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out but by prayers and fasting. So a couple questions. First of all, who casted this demon out? The disciples failed. They came to Christ. Who casted the demon out? That's a question for you. It's simple. It's not a trick question. Christ. Christ. Good. Second question. So it seems that in this case they had trouble, but the idea is that in the past the disciples were able to successfully cast out demons. This is the time where they have an issue. So my next question is, in those previous instances, who casted out the demons? This is a trick question. Christ. Christ. Uh, if, if the idea is that the disciples were doing something wrong or that they weren't powerful enough to do that's not what it was. Either way, it was Christ. In this instance, they end up doing the same thing that they've been doing all along, which is inviting Christ into the situation to bring about the resolution. Um, and if the disciples thought it was by their own power, well, it sounds like maybe they did because Christ kind of sets them straight. Uh, I mean, they dropped everything that they had to follow him, and he calls them a faithless and perverse generation. Um, but he's clearly saying something. They have a lot of faith. They've done something. Um, but there is a next step that they need to take, the step of, of prayers and fasting. So the final question is, what was different in this situation? Why were they... Why did they fail here where they succeeded before? Um, any ideas on that? Was there anything different? Or can we draw any hints from the context? Like lack of faith? Lack of faith? I think that's part of it. But lack of faith in proportion to what? Because they were successful in previous situations. Their faith wasn't perfect, it sounds like. Yeah? I don't know, because I'm thinking of it as it's like, kind of like a little puzzle, because it's the prayer and fasting. And if I, we go to the St. Nectarius uh, you know, uh, scenario as well, it's, maybe it's patience that's, that's the missing ingredient. And maybe patience. Because it, the patience and, and persistence, really, because it's like the, 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 the prescription for the grandmother is the, is the 40, uh, you know, it's, it takes time as well. Mm -hmm. Fasting, I guess if you think of it this way, it's a purification, but it's also, it's also a, a labor of patience, you know, patiently enduring. Uh, you know, not, not, not eating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a labor of patience so as well. That's an element that's missing. You can't just invoke the name of Christ as you stand and cast out these demons. You have to actually work for it a little bit more. Okay, yeah. So you have to work for it a little bit more. I think we can put both of those two together because there's something going on with the level of faith that the disciples have. But it also seems that while they were successful in the past, they're still not quite where they're going. This is still a process even for these fishermen who dropped everything to follow Christ. There is patience and there's still growth involved. Um, and I think, first of all, if we pick apart that last sentence, the highlighted bit, this kind does not come out but by prayers and fasting. This kind, we might take to say that there's something different about this particular situation. It's maybe the disciples did all right in previous situations because I'm, I'm going off on a limb here a little bit, but whether the demon was weaker or it was somehow an easier situation. But this kind is harder. This kind is more difficult. Something in this situation does not lend itself to the disciples bringing about a, situ uh, a resolution. Uh, do you have something, Tad? I was just thinking that the prayers and fasting strengthen us. They are our spiritual armor. Exactly. Exactly. There's something about the, the spiritual strength we gain from the prayer and fasting. And so we find out that there's something difficult about the situation. And so Christ tells them what they need to do to strengthen themselves sufficiently. But again, what do prayers and fasting do? Prayer is reaching out to God. It is speaking to God. It's also listening to God. It's connecting with God. And what's fasting putting ourselves in line with God's will. It's denying our own will so that we can hear over the noise of our own will and we can hear God's will. So both of these point to some sort of issue and connection with God. Prayer and fasting facilitate that connection. Now again, the disciples were faithful people, but when the rubber hit the road, they needed to take that next step. Not just be in the state of faithfulness, but be taking active steps to do that spiritual strengthening 
to be exercising themselves through the asceticism that comes with prayer and fasting. So, likewise, let's continue the story with St. Nectarios uh, and the advice he gives to the grandmother. The grandmother comes back to St. Nectarius and says, nothing happened. And Father Nectarius said, 40 more days. Do paraclesy for 40 more days. The grandmother, after that, she started walking down home, walk, going home, and she went by the market and she said, my daughter always loved a certain dish, a certain meal she was making. I think I'm going to make that for my family, for my grandchildren. As she is purchasing the ingredients, going home, making the food, the kids, their senses tell them homesickness, and they start crying, and they're deciding to sort of find the courage to go back home and face whatever it is to be facing. At that moment, what we see is that St. Nectarius gave the grandmother 40 more days, and the grandmother left knowing the, the, the intellectual part, if I do 40 more days, something will happen. The miracle will happen. And I want us to stop there because we really don't know when God is going to intervene. And the story goes as follows. The kids are getting ready, uh, are leaving with the bus to go home. The grandmother comes home and she gets a, a, a terrible phone call. Her husband, the, the, her daughter tells her, informs her that her husband had a terrible accident and he is taken to the emergency room and he is um, experiencing a, a, um, a stroke, um, which in the end caused him to be paralyzed in the right side. We never know how things are going to happen. And one thing that I want to point out is that patience, yes, we need patience. We really don't know when there is resistance for pe from people to follow our expertise, our advice, our guidelines. This is the hardest part of a therapist today as it was for St. Nectarius or Father Nectarius at that time, when he saw the grandmother coming to him saying, no results. But he had that kind of confidence and he sent her away with one more dosage of the magic, of the, um, of the ingredient that is needed. And then um, we want to sort of stop here and, and process what is that makes um, this kind of situations where our expertise and our approach is not really working. The disciples were a holy people. They were living with Christ and they had that touch of Christ, but they also were human beings. And whatever they had inside them, their preoccupation, what we call in Greek logismi, thought processes, there are certain things that take our focus away from Christ. Uh, let's go on with that. So with St. Nectarios, we see that by some strange situation, both of the problems are solved. The children decide to go home. The grandmother doesn't have to force them. And an unfortunate accident happens to their father, which stops him from abusing them. Everything somehow falls into place in a way that no human could have coordinated. So, coming back to the important part, what advice did St. Nectarios give to the grandmother? I'll, I'll open that up. Yes. Uh, pray and fast. Pray and fast. The same exact advice, basically. Cultivating the spiritual life is what it came down to. Now, again, where did the solution come from? Was it from St. Nectarios? Was it from the grandmother having the idea to create this dish? W where did it really come from? Where's the root of it? Christ. Christ. Same again. 
Now, had St. Nectarios been able to give some more practical advice that would have solved the problem, in that case, where would the solution have come from? Say, for example, he said, um, okay, you're in this situation. What you need to do is call the police, call Child Protective Services, which, you know, they wouldn't have had at that point, uh, and all this stuff, and that solved the problem. Where would that solution have come from? Would that have just been from his own rational conclusions? Or where's the real cause of it? Christ. Christ. Thank you. So now we want to abstract that a little bit and see what we learn about resistance and compliance and otherwise about difficult versus straightforward situations. Um, just pulling it straight out of those stories, what we see starting with resistance, uh, situations of resistance, is that we need to be praying, we need to be fasting, and we need to be inviting Christ into the situation to help because ultimately that's where the resolutions come from. So that's on the one side. Now, in more straightforward situations where perhaps our education is enough to reveal some kind of resolution, uh, we need to be praying, we need to be fasting, and we don't need Christ because we know what to do. No, we need to invite Christ to help. And this chart may seem like a little, a little too easy, a little too simple, a little too straightforward, um, but I have to confess that the reason why I have to include this and why I have to focus on this is because the thought that comes through my mind, if someone tells me something like this, when you're in this difficult situation, pray fast, invite Christ to help. When the situation is not so difficult, you should be doing that anyway. My reaction is, yeah, 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 I'll pray, but how am I actually going to fix this? How am I actually going to fix this? Because prayer is not going to do anything is the implication of that. And I always catch myself thinking that. To be honest, I think if, if that sentence was said in less parish council meetings, our parishes would be in a better situation. Uh, we hear it too often all around us. But yeah, 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 we'll pray, we'll pray. We're doing all the church stuff, but let's get real. How are we going to fix this? So I'm going to kind of give us the benefit of the doubt here as we break down the different kinds of conflicts we run into. Let's say that we're really good. 95% of the situations we run into are straightforward. We know what to do. The solution comes from our experience or from our education. Um, it's only 5% that are basically impossible, just like the disciples, totally unable to cast out this demon, just like the grandmother, totally unable to come up with any way to help both her daughter and her grandchildren. So, starting with the impossible side, we're kind of reiterating a bit here, but where does the solution come from? It needs to come from some other means. We don't have it in our power to do it. It's got to come from somewhere else. That's usually something miraculous. We need Christ to step in and do something. Um, when it's straightforward, okay, maybe it comes from our education. Maybe we didn't actually get on our knees and pray. Maybe it comes from our experience. Maybe we had some idea from a previous thing that, yes, I've been here before. I've seen someone with this issue before. I know exactly what to tell them. I told it to them, and it solved the problem. Sometimes it really can be that straightforward. Um, and again, it's easy in that situation to say, okay, well, I did good. I know what to do. That came from me. Uh, what would St. Paul say to that? St. Paul would say, for what makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? That's 1 Corinthians 4, 7. If you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Hinting at the fact that, okay, well, maybe, you know, what I have from my education, from my experience, it's not necessarily me at its core. It's something good, but even that was given to me. Uh, if we take a step further, uh, St. Mark the ascetic tells us, it is impossible for us to have faith in anything good or to carry it into effect except in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So it's impossible to carry anything good into effect, except through Christ. That's from his text on the spiritual law in the Philokalia collection. So anything good that we do, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, came from Christ. So what these have in common is that Christ intervenes in order to solve the problems. Um, and the reality behind that is, whether we know it or not, we're inviting Christ. If anything good comes out of it, if any resolution comes about, it's because we invited him. Whether we invited him by getting on our knees and praying, or whether we invited him 
with our good intentions as therapists or clinicians, uh, by doing well in our education, by reaching out and wanting to assuage the suffering of the world around us. Either way, anything good that we do is calling for Christ into the situation. This is where they're most different, however. In the straightforward situations, we can be good enough. Great. We dropped everything we had. We were baptized. We're in the church. We're following Christ. Maybe we're not praying and fasting on a regular basis, but we're on the right track. We're in the right body. Um, or at least we have good intentions. At least we're aiming for the right things. Good enough. We can invite Christ into the situation, whether we know it or not. And he can help without us getting in his way. The margin of error is wider. But for these impossible ones, we must be perfect. Be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, as Christ tells us. Now, that's a tall order, but the issue is that when things get more difficult, we need to be in lockstep with Christ or else we get in his way. We make things worse. We get into the situation and we think we're helping because we don't think Christ has anything to do with it. I'm going to find an answer and I end up making it worse. But to be perfect is to be perfect in our prayer and perfect in our fasting, or at least to strive towards it because the margin of error is much narrower. This is where we really need to rely on Christ. Uh, the next question that that leads us to is what is our role in the healing process? If it's Christ doing everything, why are we here? Now there is some synergy involved. We, we need to be there. And I think this is exemplified by Matthew eleven eighteen 18 to 30. Christ says to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that sounds really nice if you gloss over it without reading it too carefully. That sounds really nice because he's offering us comfort. It doesn't sound as nice when you think about what a yoke is. And you look at that muddy field and consider being tied by the neck to a plow. That's not the idea that you have when someone is inviting you because you're weary and burdened. You want a pillow and a mattress. Anything but a yoke and a muddy field. But the issue is that we're all in this muddy field, this muddy field that is a world of suffering and pain. That's a reality. And we all have a lot of work to do. The harvest is ready, but someone's got to work on it. And what you'll notice about the yoke is that there's not one ox in there. There's two oxen. A yoke ties together two animals to the plow. So if Christ is inviting us to take on his yoke, it's because he's in the other position. He's inviting us to take that second spot. The kind of comfort that Christ is offering us is the comfort rather than poking around in the darkness with a shovel hoping that we'll get this work done in this world of suffering. We can line up next to him. We can take his lead. We can know exactly what we're doing and where we're going because we're following him. And he'll do the heavy work as he already has. We just have to be walking in line with him and being part of the process. When Christ offers us his yoke, he's not offering us a break, but it is something of comfort. And I think this image here is what it means to be doing this kind of clinical care or helping care with Christ. And finally, I want to use this quote. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. That is the, the second rule from uh, psychologist Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Because it's very easy to read those stories and to say, okay, they give the advice of prayer and fasting. So maybe sometimes when people come to me, I need to tell them, you need to do more prayer and fasting. Or people come to us and have an issue of maybe I need to tell them to do 40 days of prayers to the Theotokos, to the Virgin Mary. Um, and it can be very easy to slip into hypocrisy, again, knowing that from my own experiences. Um, but in this case, especially when it comes to something like this, where we're really trying to help, where we're tr really working on the problem that is the suffering in the world, uh, hypocrisy is not just rude. It can be everything that stands between us and any kind of resolution. It's, it's, it's essential. Again, it's easy to think that we're separate from the situation. The client has his problem. As long as he does the right thing, as long as I tell him to pray, I'm not really directly connected to it. Um, but... There are, that is kind of a partially blind view. Uh, we are very, our spiritual lives are essential. And the reason St. Nectarios was able to give that advice is because he himself was praying and fasting every day. The reason Christ could give that advice is the same. 
Uh, so we need to consider ourselves both, yes, it's good to sometimes give that advice, it's something important, but we also need to be receiving it. And by doing that, we can transition from, yeah, 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 I'll pray, but seriously, let's get real, how are we going to fix this? To, well, to, as St. Paul says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ. I'm not, yeah, I'll talk to Christ, but how do we do it? It's through Christ. So at that, I want to pass it off to the third story, which will be more discussion-oriented, and we'll okay. see what's happening here. So here we're going with a typical clinician, with me, typical clinician, where we get the education, I put it up there, and I'm covered, and I know exactly how to take care of every case, and based on this, as I'm describing it to you, you will see that everybody should comply. There should be no resistance. Yeah. Even the theory of if I analyze it and I speak their language, then they will be able to understand what is going on so they will comply. What I have come to realize is that there's not about absolute compliance. My enemy is not absolutely resistance. And that is the tricky part, that it is about where the compliance and resistance can meet in the name of Christ. Keep that in mind as I'm going with this uh, technical, clinical, straight textbook masterpiece. If I am whole, like the word says, I'm integrated, I have clarity, I am purified, I don't have preoccupations, I don't have stress, I don't have anxiety, I'm able to see things clearly. Textbook. If I'm half, which means things have happened in my life where I'm preoccupied and I'm hurting, I'm angry, and my feelings are getting in the way so I cannot see clarity. Textbook. I will enter survival mode. And the classical thing about survival mode, which is where all the um, resistance comes, is that my reality is seen through uh, dark glasses. I don't see the whole light. I will deny that there is a problem, or I will focus on something else so that I will escape of the problem, and that is detour. I will procrastinate facing the problem, which is delay, and slowly but surely, it is like a parachute is bringing me close because this might not make the problem go away, so I start feeling dilemma. I'm entering the, the world of depression because in the end I'm feeling defeat, and then I might go back into denial. So we face this as clinicians in, in our office, and if you have faith, like this whole um, workshop is based on, if we have faith, then why can't we have Christ do what we want him to do? Why the disciples had faith? Why could they make it happen, what the Father wanted from them? If uh, Father Nectarius, Saint Nectarius, had faith, he was actually Christ's soldier. Why did he have to wait for 40 days and all these things, fasting? Why? The word is effort. The word is effort. Faith cannot lead to focus unless we go through the effort. And that was prayer and fasting and persistence. And you mentioned waiting. Yes because that is effort. And it is like the, the yoke that we saw, it's not easy. And that is the part of the humility. And one of the things that um, we hear from Christ over and over again, which made me uh, think about the whole uh, acronym, is he always said, peace be with you, Irini Min, peace be with you. So. The, the magic thing is that we have to bring 
peace, inner peace inside us. How do we w do it with the world we live in? How can we do that? Um, some people try with yoga. Some people try with meditation. But truly, when we live in a half world, how can we stay whole? How can we use the half world to strengthen our wholeness? And I'm going to share with you a story that um, really was a turning point for my life. And that story is a lady walks into my office, and she is a professional clinician, uh, very Christian, Catholic, and she says to me that I have gone through therapy for 10 years, I'm married for 40 years to my husband, and I, uh, my husband at some point, he's a great man, wonderful man, great with the grandchildren, wonderful with my children. Um, he got involved in cocaine addiction, and then he developed some um, dependency in getting involved with prostitution also. She went to therapy, he went to rehabs, they went in and out through therapy for 10 years. And she pretty much went to much better therapies than me. Well known, way much better. And the last clinician that spoke to her said, you have two choices. The one choice is get a divorce. The second choice is put up with what is going on and be a martyr. And she said no to both uh, suggestions and he could not serve her anymore. And then she came to my office. And I smiled and I listened and I took it all in and she wanted to see me again. And before my second opinion, I called my Paris priest and I scheduled uh, an appointment with him. Uh, I went to his office, to, 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 to church, and I said to him, I don't know what to do with her. For 10 years, everything has been um, tried. And I don't think I have to offer more, any more than what the other therapist offered her. That, and I was just making that statement, it will take a miracle. And then my priest said, and that's what we are going to look for. And he told me, of course I'm Greek, and he was speaking in Greek, and he told me the prayer in Greek. Vasilefe puranie paraklite, to pneuma tis alithias o pandahu paron, και τα πάντα πληρών, ελθέ και σκήνωσον εν ημίν, και καθάρισον από πάσης κυλίδος, και σώσον αγαθέτας ψυχάς ημών. This is in Greek what the prayer we all said collectively in the beginning. And I said, I got that one. So originally, every time before I schedule the appointment, I will say that prayer myself. Eventually, as part of the session, I pretty much shared that. I was honest with her as we developed report. And what I focused on in our session was how she could take time to um, what I call go by milk, remove herself from the situation, to regroup herself so that she will not be half. Um, I want to stop here and I want to ask from you, what do you think would have helped in this situation and what do you think um, it could help my client overcome that uh, standstill situation she was in?
Um, I, did, I was just thinking that um, in the in the very first story, I just kind of want to reference when Nico was speaking, like the very first line, you know, and when they had come to the multitude of men, came to him kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. And I just, I, it was just striking to me in all these examples that maybe as therapists, as physicians, as caregivers, you know, we look at all these things as so transactional. You know, we love those who love us. We don't like those who don't like us. We can help those who will listen to us. Like, it's a very transactional thing. And I felt, I felt like the pieces that are missing in that story is that reliance on Christ, as Nico was saying. But actually, not just that. It's just, it's the concept of mercy. And, and like, that's you starting your session with prayer. I mean, you're not going to heal her. Christ is. But it's more accepting the mercy. It's, it's imbalanced. It's imbalanced, and I feel like we forget to recognize that this concept is very imbalanced, this concept of caregiving, and that mercy is imbalanced. It's not a transactional thing. It's not because I give to you, I'm going to receive what I give. So I, exactly. I don't know if that answers, exactly. but exactly. that's my opinion. And that is so true, because at that moment, it was about stepping back and letting Christ come into my place. And it is that critical moment when the, my education and my expertise had to experience that humility of this. If I want to really serve her, I have to get into that yoke with Christ. And I will also have her come. And it is that moment where patient or client and provider have that moment where the, the provider uh, is not that she's getting the solution at that moment. And the provider is not giving that solution. The, the client is not receiving the solution. The provider is not. And it is that kind of missing piece that uh, usually we are supposed to say, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. Uh, uh, here is my fee paid. And it was that moment where it was, we looked at each other and we said, we are actually going to, do, to take that trip together. Are you willing? And that is exactly what she needed at that moment, not to be alone, to take that journey with somebody else. Thank you. Nico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we don't know how, you know, it's, it's an impossible scenario. But the way, the way I, I imagine I would handle it, and I have, I have had experiences with stuff like that, is that there's, it's, it, it, one way to look at it is that when we're confronted with, a, with a, a, you know, any kind of, a, of, a, an, of an obstacle that's insurmountable, we can, either, we can either act on it, on the obstacle itself. There has to be, the, the movement has to either come outside of me in the environment, and if I can't change that, which in this case you couldn't change that, then I have to change some, something inside me. So I actually like what the previous therapist told her, which was you either got to leave them or you've got to become a martyr. So what I would, the way that I work and the way that I would take her, I, was, I would basically invite her on the martyric path. But I would go there, as you said, I would go there with her. And, and she wouldn't really know that that's what she was doing because we would do that through the internal changes because I think that's what ends up happening when people come in suffering in these uh, dilemmas where they don't know what to do about it. It's because they haven't, they're suffering the pain, but they haven't been able to locate those internal doors that are locked to open up so that when those doors are opened up, that pain, because the pain is telling us that we have to change something. We have to either practice more faith, we have to practice forgiveness, patience, whatever it might be. And those are all internal activities that we do. So, you know, it would be a process of doing that, of if, if, the, per, if the person could, could, could tolerate it. I mean, that's the other issue. And that was another comment I was going to make that came up earlier, which is I think a, a huge part of resistance and treatment is that, you know, like when I was thinking about when St. Nectitis gave the woman the, the, the second dosage of 40 paracletes, you know, that's when my patients tell me, you know, you know, Come on, man! You're just making this stuff up. You know what I mean? <laughs> they do. They think I'm just making this stuff up. And I'm, but I, but I see where those doors are, and I know if they just knock on them a little bit more, something will give inside, That's and they'll have those moments where, you know, there's those transformative things, which as 
many of us have experienced as well. Sometimes those internal things, because they end up becoming linked, we, we do include Christ in our practices and this sort of thing, that not only do they get the internal transformation, but then all of a sudden something happens to the guy, and next thing you know he's at an AA meeting and he's getting sober, and you're like, how did that happen? So anyway, that's, those are my comments. I like very, very much what you said about the Marty role because we are not trained, we are trained to protect our patients or our clients from going in that end. We are trying to keep them active, do something for yourself. And it is that kind of the Marty role that there is a path to take someone to. And that is the role that I took, but I took it in the form of we are going to set ground rules as we are going on. All I want from you, and that is when I used these acronyms and I said, all I want from you is when you find yourself going through that um, survival mode, go by mail, remove yourself from the situation. And she will go and she will, he will be away, not all the time, uh, two, three times a year, but he will disappear and the bank will be getting thinner and thinner. And at that time, she found it comforting to um, go to a hotel, go on a trip, go to a hotel, not to be there when he came. She locked him out. It was ups and downs that went on. I was with her, and it was not rational decisions, but I was putting them under the umbrella of you're going to buy milk. You're removing yourself from the situation so you will stay whole. And what came, what happened that did not come from my work, did not come from her uh, locking him out, did not come from any of this. As she was um, going through this... Um, terrible things. One Christmas, she came, they, they had uh, gatherings at home. Uh, he left the Christmas party, the family party with grandchildren and everything. He did not come back until j end of January. And it was things like that. And one time, she got a phone call as she was coming home from a terrible place of New Jersey, Camden. He had a heart attack as she was driving, and he was in a car accident. He, all, nobody knows how he made it, how he survived. He survived. And it took him about several, several months in the hospital and then coming home and he's still um, uh, device dependent. He cannot really uh, be well completely, but he's healing. But what he's healing the most is that when he was able to be a conscious, he knows exactly what happened to him. When he was able to be conscious, he saw the face of his wife. And he said, how is this possible? After all I put you through. They have been married for 40 years, 50 years by then. And that was the first time in the bed of the hospital that he opened his eyes and he realized who his wife was. And it was very much of a miracle when this woman that she was going through um, anger, resent she did not want to divorce him, but she was really angry at him, at his behavior. And she was going through that roller coaster ride of guilt, anger, I, uh, I, that's it, I want a divorce. And then, no, I cannot do that to my family. He's a wonderful grandfather. And the moment that he opened his eyes, he saw her smiling. And she said to me, I have no idea why I smiled after all that he put me through. <laughs> I wanted to punch him, but a smile came into my face, and I was happy that, and not for one minute, I wish he would die. So um, that is, after all I'm saying, I want us to go back to the first um, slide. Very first. Not before. B. 
be afterwards. How are they different? Are they different? We talk about something from today, and we talk about something that happened 2,000 years ago, and something in last um, years ago. How is that different? Is it different? How are they related? What do solutions come from? And what is, the what is our, clean uh, our role? And is our role any different than the role of say nectarius or the role of um, the disciples? Thank you. Um, I was just thinking about in these stories and I think I'm sure in so much of our work that the solutions don't are not immediate in those impossible situations and so the role of waiting and I wondered if either of you wanted to say anything just about our posture as we wait, how to encourage our clients that waiting is natural and okay and yeah. Actually, we cannot tell them that it is natural and okay because even if we tell them, they will not hear it. The, that's why that uh, slide of the yoke, can you? That's like, uh, it is, and, and there are some clients that they will sort of say, oh, you did not give me an answer. I'm waiting for so long. I'm wasting my money. I'm wasting my time. That is waste of time. The beauty is that the client can stop coming to see me, but the solution doesn't stop come going to her. The solution will arrive to her if, as a clinician, I do my 5% my part. As a clinician, during the time that I am serving the person, I'm actually serving. I cannot make the client serve. But I can definitely, I, that is in my power. So the solution doesn't stop the last day that the client comes to see us. It keeps on going, and that is the beauty. This was like the paralyzed man whose friends brought him to Jesus. That they got in there and took him. And if somebody had told me when I was at my most miserable, sit and wait, it, it will come to you, I, I, whether it's true or not, I didn't want to hear that. But to have them pick me up on their shoulders and to carry me and place me before Christ, that's where my relief came from. That's right. That's right. I'm going to make an odd comment. Some of you may not know, but this is a family. This is her son and this is her daughter. They're a modern icon. I want to say this. So many families struggle in this country, in this world, with dysfunction, with healing, with brokenness. They're an example. Look at them. Three of them in the church. Love God. Serve the Lord. This is also our strength and our example. Thank you, Chuck. Nico. I have something to share, not really a question, but um, I was sharing this prayer with um, Philip on the break, and I thought, wow, this might be appropriate for this group, and I just wanted to offer these copies to you all before I leave. Um, I'm a clinical social worker. I work on the streets um, as well as in a county jail. And a number of years ago when I was encountering an unusual number of um, 
evil spirits at one point. I mean, now and then you encounter them, but it seemed like during this period of time, there was a lot. And I went to a um, wise old teacher friend of mine, and I said, as an Orthodox Christian, can you recommend um, anything um, to shake this work off when we have heavy days and we're encountering a lot of this oppressiveness and the work that we do? Um, and he said two things. Number one, develop a close relationship with the Archangel Michael. And I did, and that has changed my life. But he said, secondly, I'm going to give you something. Come back tonight, meet me at this place, and I'll give you a prayer. And he, he took the prayer um, from my understanding, which is a prayer that priests pray um, after confession for cleansing, after they hear confessions. And he altered it somewhat and he made it a prayer for cleansing of mind and body to be invoked after working with trauma or healing disease so it's a self-care prayer and i just um happened to have some copies in my backpack and i thought i'd leave them here if anybody wants them it's really helped me so i pray this every night when i come in or before i go to bed and that's helpful do you want to read and hear it okay it's brief He says, this is so you don't take your work home with you. He was talking about the demons, but. (laughs) Oh, Lord, thank you for the service of this day, for the work that you've placed before me. As you healed the ten lepers and you healed all who sought your blessing, now heal thy servant. Let all negation and the effects of sin that have come upon me now be removed from my being. Oh, Lord, purge my body. And cleanse my mind. And may the light of Christ now enter and fill me completely. That my only thought be of you. I accept this through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Thank you. That was beautiful. Any more questions? Two minutes. Thank you so very much for coming.